Okay, great. I, my name is Ann Sylvester. I am in the Department of Molecular Biology and I have been here since about 1999. I teach biochemistry, genetics, um, and I'm also a researcher. My research is in corn genetics. Uh, I grow corn in this greenhouse. We've got two houses here um, where I grow corn practically year round. And then I have two crops a year. One crop in Colorado that's just finishing up now. Uh, and it it's, uh, has a little longer season, which is why we grow in Colorado. And then I get a second generation of corn in Hawaii. So we go to Hawaii in January for another crop. The reason for this is because this is genetics. This is maintaining lines of plants for multiple generations. And in order to study them, we need as many generations as possible. So that's why we squeeze in two. You can really only get two crops a year, summer and winter. So the corn that I'm working on is research corn. Um, research corn is a little bit more like the original corn. You may not know this, but corn was actually, is totally a man-made crop. So the original corn that, that we selected from it came from a very bushy grass that was about this big, and it was selected in Mexico for certain traits that made it good for eating. And since, since that time, we have selected for traits that make corn more edible, make it a better forage crop, make it a bigger plant. Everything that you see has, is due to genetic breeding, breeding and growing new traits. That's essentially what I am interested in. I'm interested in finding traits that will help make corn a better crop. We always want to improve our crops uh, and we can always do that. There's no limit to what we can do with a crop plant. Uh, because of the number of genes that are present in the plant and what we can do with the genes. So my approach is, is like a standard breeder. I select for a trait. And I want to show you in this ear what I mean by trait. Um, uh, for me, I'm going to use the term mutation. So a mutation is a, ch a change in a single gene that affects the appearance of something. Okay, and what we have here is, is an ear of corn. I mean, what do you notice about this corn, first off? Multicolors. What, what do you see? Well, I see multicolored, and the kernels look smaller, and the kernels look smaller than on, um, than on corn people use for eating. That is really, op that's a really good observation. And so, I think, oh. so this, the purple color is actually the natural color of corn. And about 3,000 years after corn was started to be selected from this bushy grass, pe the, the people who were selecting it decided that yellow was a better color. We wanted to eat something yellow. And so they found a mutation that, that, is due, that causes the yellow color from the purple color. So that is one trait, an example of one trait that was bred into corn. Now all of our eating corn is yellow. You rarely ever eat a purple kernel, do you? You don't, you don't go to the store and get purple corn. So that's one trait that we, the way that we changed corn from its natural state of purple. Another thing that happened that we did, and this happened in about the 50s, is that a geneticist, you know, like me, who's just out there in the field working, discovered that there was another trait that determined how much sugar was made in the kernel. And if you've ever eaten a potato, and sometimes a potato is very starchy, Sometimes it can be super sweet, taste a little sweeter. The reason for that is that sugar gradually turns into starch. And if you can eat the potato before it becomes overly starchy, it'll taste a little sweeter. So this geneticist discovered that there was a type of corn that made extra, uh, made extra sugar and didn't turn that sugar into starch. And that became, he discovered that trait he bred it into all of our eating corn, and that became our super sweet corn. There are several different types of super sweet corn, all due to finding this trait that affects the formation of starch and making the corn much sweeter. So that's a second example that I want to give you of how geneticists can select for traits. Yes? The purple, does that indicate that usually red in a plant indicates the sugar content? So if it had been purple, if they'd select it for purple? Might it have been sweeter without having to find it? That's a really good point. So in this case, the purple color is not linked or connected to sweetness. 
Um, and corn is a little bit unique in that way because corn has this extra fleshy part to the kernel that's a little different from other seeds. And the, the pathway to starch is a little bit different from other plants, but that's a really good, good question. So that link is not, it has not been connected for color to sweetness. So what, what I'm interested in and what I'm studying is a different trait, not related to the ear. I study the shape of the plant. And the reason I study the shape is because that is another feature that we've changed over the thousands of years to make corn a better crop. So corn used to be, for example, much smaller. It had very short leaves. Um, and in fact, you can take this poster with you. Um, this is a poster that came out in the journal Science that actually we made here at the University of Wyoming. And um, it, can, it will tell you a lot, of, a, a lot of the history of maize. And I have lots of these, so feel free to take them. This is the original plant of, uh, that, that, turned in, that was selected to become corn. And here's corn. And you can notice the plant got much bigger, the leaves got bigger, the shape changed. And this has been partly because of the selection for a plant that would yield more, grow more, adapt better to different types of agricultural conditions. And my, what, what most maize corn geneticists believe now, we all believe, corn has endless potential to become a better plant. And so the, the, the potential that I'm looking at is the shape. What can we do to the shape of the plant to make it yield more, grow better, produce better, uh, be less, uh, le use less resources, use less water, and continue to be productive for feeding the world's population? And so the trait that I'm studying is the shape of the leaf. And what I'm interested in, if you look at a lot of different corn plants, you can see that the leaf shape changes a little bit. What I have here are two different plants, and I want you to take a look at them. Uh, this is a single gene mutation that I'm studying, and meaning it's a single trait that we've linked to a single gene. And if you look at this plant, um, and feel free to come over, touch it, look at it, examine it. What do you see that's different about it? And I'll tell you after you have a chance. I bet you can see something different. Well. So this is the normal plant. Come on up and take a look. You can poke at it. Plants like to be touched, especially corn, because it likes to grow in wind. And so you can touch it, feel it, take a look at what's different about it. Well, these, this one has more waxy leaves. Feels more waxy, okay. And these leaves seem to be slightly yeah. longer and thinner. Longer and thinner, good one. Longer and thinner, that's a shape, that's a shape difference. Mm -hmm. Thinner stalk. Thinner stalk, the stalk is thinner. I had to prop this one up actually. <laughs> All of this is due to one change that I'll, I'll show you. If you look really carefully at the leaf, So let me draw your attention and let me tell you about the leaf and then you'll see it. I bet if I tell you about the, so a, a corn leaf start, let, let's look at it starting here and notice that it has this flat blade that goes to about here and then it continues all the way down. Okay, this is one leaf, that entire thing. Notice right here, there's this little structure. That's a joint, basically. It's like a knee joint, but it's a leaf joint. And no, look at what it's doing that joint causes this blade to go out at an angle. Now this is really important because the blade captures sunlight. That's the whole function for a leaf. You want to capture sunlight. The sunlight is the energy from sunlight makes sugar. That feeds the world, feeds the plant. So this joint is holding the blade out at an angle. That's good for the leaf, but look at what it does to the shape of the plant. It makes it pretty broad. Okay, now take a look at this mutant and look right at that joint. So what's amazing about this is this is a single gene mutation. Just like the super sweet, single gene changed the sweetness, this single gene removes the ligule and look at what it does to the shape of the plant. So you know, if it weren't so windy, it might be easier to see, but you can see that it's much narrower, taller, and it's, it's basically taking up less space. But essentially, it's got all the leaves, it's got everything else that's normal, and it reproduces normally. Okay, so we have a single gene mutation controlling the shape of the leaf to a certain extent. 
and this is what I'm interested in, this is what I'm studying. I, I study this from the molecular level. I ask, what is the gene that is con doing this and what is it actually doing? How is it working? The, but ultimately, we can see this as a trait that can be bred into other plants, into other lines of plants. You, you can see there's a trade-off for this mutation, right? You are, all of you saw and pointed out the leaves are narrower. That's not so good. A narrower leaf won't capture as much energy from sunlight. You can see it's flimsier. But because this is a single trait that's causing all of these other kind of appearances, we can start crossing this into other lines of plants that have maybe even broader leaves, change those shapes, so that we can develop a line that brings out the best of this mutation and the best of the other mutations. That's what breeding is all about, and that's why corn, as I say, is totally human-made. So we study this process, and the, the, what's very important to keep in mind is that the only reason we know about this is because this is a pure line. This is a line that is genetically pure, and I've selected it and maintained it to keep stay that way. And that is what is the basis for breeding. So we have to make sure that, for example, if we open, does anybody know what open pollination is? Someone asked me at dinner about, oh, what, what do you think it is? I think that it means that you expose this so docks completely and just let the wind and in some plants bees but bees don't really pollinate corn. You're absolutely right. So that's open pollination. But what would you what would happen if we allowed this plant to open pollinate? Well, it would it might get it might get bred with something you don't want. Exactly. Thank you. You should come and help teach my class with me. <laughs> as well that's, as the other class. That's right. <laughs> that's completely fine if you're say growing it in your yard so you can this is a future maize geneticist. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. And that's what we do all summer long in our field in Colorado. We have an acre that we grow down there. We do controlled pollinations. And the purpose of that is to get the pollen from one plant and bring it onto the ear of another. And the reason for that is the pollen has the sperm, the pollen is the dad, the ear has the egg, the, the ear is the female. So we do a controlled fertilization and we know exactly what the parents are. And that way we can maintain this line and we can, we can cross this line and we can start doing our breeding process, start crossing it into a whole other a line of plants if we want. Um, and if we don't do controlled pollinations, what's your name? I'm Ted. Ted is absolutely right. If we don't do the controlled pollinations, we'll lose this trait immediately. It will just get open pollinated and it will look like every other corn plant around. But this is the trait we want to preserve. How many, how many generations have you gone through? Have you any idea? I mean, now you've been around here for a long time. Yes, um, we get two generations a year. I actually first studied this mutation in 1994. <laughs> and we've had two generations a year. I, 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 I left it for a little while and I came back to it more recently. So um, right now it's in the, a pure line that is at least eight generations. The line that it was in when I first found it in 1994 was not a pure line. So yeah, this is, this is about eight generations right How here. How long did it take you to find that particular gene? Or did, was that by accident? No, it was, um, it was found through a specific process where we take a line of plants and we cause mutations. We use a chemical to cause mutations, and then we screen through the, through the, the all of the, we screen thousands and thousands of plants. We look at them and select for a particular mutation. And so that was, that happened in one generation because we do the, the mutagenesis, we cause a mutation, then we find it, and then it takes a long time to make sure that it's a real mutation. That's what all of the crossing is. And the next thing I can do is show you how I do crosses if you want to stay and, and see that. Um, all of my plants have fallen over, but I can still <laughs> show you over here how I do a controlled, controlled pollination. Do you want to see this, Ted? So I, what I did was just to bring some of our old plants out from the greenhouse, um, just so I could do some demonstrations. 
Um, let me take this off because this was this is where the ear of interest is. And so let me just show you these. This plant is um, this has a good ear, and then we'll take this one down. So I can show you a couple of traits here. Okay, so here's an ear. Now I, I cut this off. Let me put the shoot bag back on. Um, this ear. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that looks on the ground. These ears have um, silks on them. You know, when you get corn to eat, and they've got these silks on them, and you you know try to pull all those silks off. They're hairy and they're difficult to get off. Actually, a single silk. You know, I've got five or six silks here. One of those silks connects down. Ted, could you pass me that ear of corn right there? The ear oh, back yeah. there? The big purple one. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Interesting. Yeah, so a silk, a single silk connects when, when this is young, connects from up here at the top all the way down and connects to one kernel. And it's at the very base of that kernel is where the egg is. So what happens is that this silk sitting out here gets pollen that comes normally from the wind. Pollen will come and shed, fly around, land on a silk, and that pollen will germinate, grow down the silk, all the way down the silk to a little kernel, and fertilize. Deposit the sperm and the egg. Fertilization takes place right there. And that's what happens naturally by wind. What I want to do is control that, because I want to choose which plant's pollen will go on which plant's ear. And so in order to choose that, I have to keep the silks completely covered from the beginning because if not, they will see pollen that I don't want them to see. I'm basically controlling who their dad is going to be. So I put this little bag that's in my apron and I wear this apron all the time in the field. It's got all my tools in it. I have this ear that's coming up and, um, and I get it before the silks have actually shown. I cover it. And I keep this shoot bag, I, and, I, and I'm walking the field every day all summer. I walk the field, make sure that all my shoots are covered. And that ear now will never see pollen unless I give it pollen. And that's what we want for controlled crosses. Okay, so I've set that up. And then let's say there's a certain day, and I want to do a cross. I want to take the pollen from one plant and put it on this one because I'm maintaining that line of mutants. So I, what I do is I come to the tassel. So the tassel here, this is all male, that's all female. So the tassel makes the pollen, sheds out that yellow stuff that comes out in the summer and makes you sneeze. And uh, that's what I want to capture in this bag. I want to capture it and put it on that ear. So the day before I'm about to do this cross, I go into the field and put a bag on the tassel and reach into my apron and staple it shut in a particular way so that we don't lose any pollen. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, first of all, I know the next day when it sheds, I'll have all fresh pollen. I won't have any contaminating pollen from anywhere else. And so this is, you know, I kind of go home after setting up the field. I come in the next day, 9.30, sun shines. It, this will shed pollen. And I take the bag, I tap out the pollen into the bag. I usually want to keep the tassel because it'll keep shedding for about four, four days. And I, I may want to keep, uh, I may want to use this, this pollen again if it's in a, a male that I really like that I want to use on another plant. And so I've got this, this uh, pollen in this bag. Um, in, in Colorado this summer, it's been very hot and dry. The pollen dies quickly. So I almost always check it with a pollen scope, which I have right here. This is a little microscope. And I take a surface, I pour the pollen out, and then I'll check with the microscope to make sure the pollen is good. Um, these plants are all very expensive because of the amount of time and uh, production that has gone into them. So I want to make sure I have good pollen before I do this. So I check the pollen, and then I come over, I'll make sure that if there's any wind around, I have to be very careful about this because when you're in a cornfield that's shedding, there's pollen everywhere, as you can imagine. And so 
if it's really windy, I make a little funnel and I pour it inside. If it's not really windy, I just go like this, tap it on. And I've actually, I haven't done this now, but I always have the family written on here, the name, because I'm then going to harvest this. I staple it and I staple it in such a way that the ear can continue to grow. So I've now fertilized that ear with exactly the pollen I want. So it doesn't need sun? It, the ear does not need sun, the plant does. The plant's gonna keep use, making sugars from the leaves. The ear does not need sun. And it will now grow and it will fill out this bag and, uh, and will grow beautifully usually if you have good pollen and, it's, and you end up getting ears that look like this. These are all ears that we harvested um, that came from some of these controlled crosses. So that's the process. And when I get these ears back, I'll harvest the Colorado crop in mid-October. We have to process the, 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 the kernels right away and we start testing them in the greenhouse. We'll grow them out, test them, see if we got the pedigree that we wanted. And the cycle begins again and we're studying. And, and that's, that's basically how breeding, um, it, breeding these lines of plants that's why it takes a lot of time, and um, that's the entire process. Do you then use that one in Hawaii? Yes, exactly. Yes. So this, so let's say this was the cross that I did here. I'll bring this back. I'll grow it out. Make sure that it was what I thought it was going to be, and then I'll take these kernels, send them to Hawaii, and grow them out in Hawaii, and do another generation. So I'll either, and I have. I know every individual in the field. I know every family that I'm working with, and I have a plan. Um, and the people in my lab, we always know, you know, wh wh why I have what I'm going to cross this to next. And a lot of this is getting um, the trait of interest into a series of different types of lines, uh, because different corn has hundreds, thousands of different lines of, of plants that are all a little different. And so we study the trait and uh, get get them into different lines that way. Um, we are totally, this is all funded by the National Science Foundation and all of our corn is public funding and public corn. So we just do distribute the corn, but not to companies. Um, they can use our corn if they want, but we distribute to other researchers all over the world actually. And, um, but this is the process that DeKalb, Monsanto, this is what we're doing here. They do this same process. Mm -hmm. Alcohol for biofuels. Yeah. Uh huh. Are they? What do they try to put in there? What, you know, the the some of the selection for corn for producing ethanol is to uh, increase the biomass, the amount of the corn, and also to make it uh, have less of the of the very um, tough material. It's called lignin that that actually is hard for animals to digest and can't be turned easily into ethanol. And so they're selecting for different lines of corn that have reduced amounts of that product in the, in the, it's a part of the cell wall basically.